Well, um, we want to talk today about the fact that we as followers of Jesus are going to have some stresses in our lives and even suffering that we will experience throughout our careers and that we will see even on a daily basis among those that we're serving as our patients. So the key thing that I'd like to share with you as we think this afternoon is about the fact that as we go through life, one of the things we really want to understand is the character of God. And as we understand the character of God, and as we understand the big picture, uh, then we'll have a better appreciation and understanding of why do not only bad things happen to good people, but why do good things happen to bad people, and understanding that God's grace is sufficient in all of our circumstances and in the circumstances that our patients face. So would you open your Bibles, or your handouts there, uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And you'll remember this verse because this is the one where Paul, who was the greatest evangelist the world has ever seen, who wrote most of or much of the New Testament scriptures, who loved God with all of his heart and was a man after God's own heart, was struggling with a chronic affliction. He had pain in his life. Uh, he called it a thorn in his flesh. We're not quite sure what that was. But he pleaded with the Lord. He pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from him, to take it out of his life. And God answered him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He records it. And he said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect. In weakness. This raises an interesting question, doesn't it, that we've all thought about, I know, and that is, why do bad things happen to good people? As we spend time in God's Word, though, and we read Scripture and meditate upon it, we recognize that as we get to know better God's character, and as we get to know better the character that we're all born with, we realize that maybe there should be another question asked first. And that is, so why do good things happen to bad people? A few months ago, I was invited by a patient of mine who uh, plays in a gospel trio. Uh, they travel around the southeast United States and do concerts, very talented. Uh, and they were frequently going into prisons to minister and do concerts. And I mentioned him, I said, oh, I'd love to do that sometime. I've, I've never been to a prison, but I'd love to go and experience that and interact there with the prisoners and inmates. And he said, well, we've got one coming up real soon. So he called me a few weeks later and he said, hey, we're going down on a Sunday morning to a prison down in Arcadia, Florida, and you're welcome to come and we'll take an intermission and you can share your testimony. I said, oh, that would be very exciting. And so I met with him. Uh, down on that Sunday morning. But when I arrived at the prison, to my surprise, this was a special prison. It was a prison for men who were considered dangerous sex offenders. From all over the United States, there were 500 in this special facility. They couldn't be in the normal population of prisons because they would probably be killed there by the inmates because they were seen as the lowest of the low. Some of these men were going to be in for life for their sexual offenses. And so as I walked in there, and I had planned what I wanted to share, and I understood the setting, I went, oh, my gosh, what am I going to say to them? And I just prayed and asked the Lord to give me something special to say. And he quickly told me exactly what I needed to share with them. As I stood there before them, several hundred men in a kind of a gymnasium, what came out, I believe, through the Lord's inspiration was to say, you know, there are a lot of people who are outside of this prison who live a life that is imprisoned every day because of the sin in their life that's controlling them. And yet I know there are men in this very auditorium right this minute who experience freedom because of the fact that they have met and receive Jesus Christ into their lives, and his Holy Spirit is alive in you, and it gives you freedom even within these walls. And so what I want to share with you guys is this, 
that though there have been some great offenses against our society and individuals that have occurred as a result of your actions and the reasons why you're here today in this prison, I want to tell you with confidence that there's not a man in this room who has committed a greater offense against God than me. And they all started laughing. And I said, no, I can prove it to you. Because, you see, I was born and raised in a home where my parents loved the Lord. And I was taught God's word. And we prayed together as a family. And I was taught to love God with my heart. And yet, as a teenager, I began to grow cold to my faith. And I began to grow cold toward Christ to the point where I remember clearly as a 16-year-old, I could not say the name of Jesus out loud in public because I would be too embarrassed. And the ultimate offense against a holy God and a loving Savior who died for me is to say, I'm embarrassed to say that I have any association with you, and I would never want anybody to know that. That's the greatest offense that we could ever commit against the Lord, and I've been very guilty of that. But, but God, but God intervened in my life in a miraculous way, and here's what it took. My father, who was my hero and certainly an idol in my life, got sick when I was a senior in high school. Uh, he contracted leukemia, acute form, and within nine months, uh, we had spent most days in the hospital, and, and uh, he came home to die. And through those months, the Lord had been there with us, and I knew it. Because I had received Jesus Christ into my heart, I knew his spirit was there. I was just running, trying to avoid contact and intimacy with him. And so through that sickness and that illness, and I want you all as physicians and doctors to hear this, he was there every minute of every day. Under every circumstance, he was faithful. And I knew that. I knew it clearly. The night before he went home to be with the Lord, uh, at 10 o'clock in the evening, he was not strong enough to speak. He couldn't even sip water. His eyes were barely open. Twelve hours before he went home to be with the Lord, he sat straight up in bed. He smiled a great big smile, and his eyes were lit up, and he pointed, and he said, Look, <laughs> there's my name, and it's written in the book. And he laid his head back down, and those were the last words he ever spoke. And I was there as he went into the presence of the Lord and left this world. And there was a presence that was there like being underwater that you knew was God's spirit. And about a month after that, the Lord had a conversation with me in silence. And he said to me, you know how much I love you, don't you? I said, yes, Lord, I do. And he said, and you know that you've been running for me, from me as hard as you can and I've been pursuing you, and I've been right there with you the whole time. You know that, don't you? And I said, yes, Lord, I know that's true. And he said, well, then I have a question for you. Are you going to spend the rest of your life running away from me, or are you right now going to decide that you're going to spend the rest of your life running to me? Let's decide right now and not play games. And I said in tears, Lord, I don't have anybody else to turn to. I, I, I have to run to you. And in the silence, I could sense his confirmation of saying, good, I'll take care of you. And I can tell you he has done that faithfully every minute since then. And so as we look at that situation in my life, I can honestly say, why do good things happen to bad people? Because of God's grace. And his grace is sufficient for our weakness, even to overcome our weakness and make something great out of something that can be a tragedy. And that was true for the men in that prison who had made so many heinous mistakes. And it was true for me as a teenager who had made many heinous mental decisions and heart decisions too. So let's just pray for a second and then dig into Scripture and see what we can find for us. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Your grace is magnificent. Your grace is overwhelming, and when we see you clearly, your grace will heal us, will make us strong, and give us all the sufficiency we need to walk through this life and on into eternity. And so we ask that you'll 
open our eyes clearly to who you are as physicians and dentists, that we may see who you are to us personally, and we may see how we can minister to others effectively. We pray now for your honor and glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you'll look at 1 Peter chapter 1, um, a book that Peter wrote that has to do with suffering. And I want you to read with me, if you will, starting with verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. Why do good things happen to bad people? Because of God's great mercy, his willingness to give us a second chance. I remember once in just a time of, of reading scripture and meditating uh, that the Lord gave me a, a silent vision of, of Christ and, and in that, that time together, in my mind's eye, I could see him on the cross and there was a ladder. It was very personal and, and real to me and on that ladder I went up and there Christ was on the cross and I was looking him face in the face and he was bleeding and suffering and, and, and I looked just eye to eye with him in that time and he looked at me and he said, you know why I'm doing this, don't you? I said, no. He said, because I love you so much. I said, I know Jesus, I love you too. And um, it's the beauty of of Christ that changes our hearts and makes genuine change within that's transformational. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy that through that he's given us new birth. And look at, as we continue with verse 3, into what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. In other words, each one of us as followers of Jesus Christ can say, hey, look, there's my name. And it's written in the book, the Lamb's Book of Life. I have new birth. There is a living hope for me. I have an inheritance saved for me in heaven by Jesus. That's his promise. I want to, as we look through these scriptures, give you four life skills principles that I hope will help you through your careers and your lives. The first one is this, and it's in your handout. Very important to understand. We are not primarily human beings having a spiritual experience. We are primarily spiritual beings having a temporary human experience. Does that make sense? Do you see how that begins to shape our perspective of circumstances that we may face? The Lord's saying, hey, you're just passing through for a short time. You may be here 30 years or maybe 50, maybe 75 or even 100, but it's only temporary. Grasp the big picture. God has an eternal plan, and you're part of that eternal plan. Look at verse 5 in 1 Peter 1 who through faith, that's us, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last times. This is extremely comforting as we face challenges and trials and even surely suffering. And that is we live shielded by God himself from all attacks and circumstances. He's powerful. He's the one that's sovereign. And he's there every single moment of our lives to the very end. And so there's a second life skills principle that, that's really been valuable to me I want to share with you, and that's this. Nothing, zero, nothing passes through the shield of God to touch my life without his permission. You see that? Nothing. There's nothing greater than the shield of God's protection around us, and nothing can touch our lives unless it's, given permission by God to pass through his shield of protection. And then here's a second point to that. And it's always for my good, and it's always for his glory. Oh, if you can grasp this, it's huge. Um, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those that love God, that are called according to his purposes. You can look up the other verses I wrote down, Philippians 2, 13, 
Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. But the point is this, that God promises that our journey will ultimately end. It will ultimately end with a very, very full salvation that will be in a sinless paradise directly and eternally in the presence of the Lord. And one more thing, it's very soon. That's very soon. And so why do good things happen to bad people? We've already seen a few reasons. One, because God is great in his mercy. That's the only reason. Because God's decided to be great in his mercy. He's decided to give us a second chance, a new birth, a living hope through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us, by his own decision, an eternal and heavenly inheritance as he has adopted us as his children. And he has promised that he will shield us and protect us by his power our whole lives. And so that's why Peter here can say in verse 6, in all this we greatly rejoice. Of course we do, because his grace is sufficient for our very full salvation. But look at 6b. Though... Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Wait, wait a second. I liked it so far, but now I have a why question. Why do bad things need to happen to those who have made, been made good by the mercy and the grace of God? And there's a clear answer to that question as we dig into Scripture. And the answer is because God has an eternal purpose for suffering, and God has an eternal purpose for trials that make those times of suffering and those trials not something that's bad, but something that's actually good. In fact, I'm going to say great. God has a way of making these things that we would call bad great. Greatness comes out of suffering, and greatness comes out of trials when God's involved. That makes sense. So let's read. In verse 7, Peter says, These things have come, why? So that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What is it that makes a person great? What is it that the heroes of the faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 all share in common? What they share in common, what makes a man or a woman great, is a genuine, persistent faith in God's mercy and in God's grace, come rain or shine. A great hero of the faith, a great man or woman of faith, is one who loves Jesus and counts it an honor to share in his suffering. It's an honor, Lord. If I can represent you through suffering, then it's an honor for me to do that. And also a great hero of faith, a person who demonstrates a great meaningful faith is one who always remembers, always, that it's about him, not me. It's about his praise. It's about his glory. It's about his honor and his alone. And so let me share a third life skills that's been meaningful to me that hopefully will help you, and that's this. Bad things happen to good people so that the genuine transformation that Christ brings can bring him glory in the world through you and me. Does that make sense? Bad things happen. They do happen. And they happen to good people. Why? So that the genuine transformation that Christ brings can bring him glory in this world through me and you. Let me read you a couple other scripture, uh, scriptures from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. See if this doesn't connect with what we're saying. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, that's his character, the, the God of all comfort, 
that's his character, who comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. We've been through a number of trials through the years, and, and uh, most recently, um, the Lord allowed, through his shield of protection, uh, something to touch our lives through uh, my precious wife, Pat, and uh, we got a diagnosis December 22nd that we're still, uh, I think, trying to assimilate, and that was of cancer. And um, we've gone through three surgeries in December, January, February. And, um, you know, that's really kind of when it all is on the line, isn't it? Uh, your faith and, and your response to the Lord and, and in his presence there. And I can tell you that his grace has been sufficient for us and his power has become very real to us uh, in our weakness. And um, we praise God for his faithfulness to us. And I praise the Lord that in this situation that um, God has brought healing. And, and we're grateful to that. In fact, Pat's here this afternoon. And, and honey, we all love you. And we're so glad that God has touched you. Um, but, you know, um, that was his decision. If he hadn't, he would bring honor and glory through that too. And we would accept that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10 says, But we have this treasure, that is Jesus, in jars of clay. Hey, we've got weak vessels that are susceptible to disease. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not about us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down sometimes but we're not destroyed. We always carry about in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. It says, Therefore we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, that far outweighs weighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is just temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Scott and I returned from Nicaragua just a few weeks ago, and we had a group of 62 on this trip, the largest trip I think CMDA has ever taken. Only Scott could pull it off. Um, but on that trip... Uh, one of the young third-year medical students that was with us uh, had lost his father Christmas Day from a heart attack at 52 years old, suddenly. And um, it was very traumatic. And here, just with fresh wounds in his heart, he was on this mission trip, uh, still giving and, and showing great godly character, but still hurting. And um, we talked about these things uh, one morning. That afternoon, I believe it was, we were in the clinics, and uh, he came over to me and he goes, what were those verses in 2 Corinthians that we were talking about? And we wrote them down, and uh, I believe it was Scott uh, or Dave, one, both of you guys, had run into a young man that was Nicaraguan, about college age, and uh, he had lost his father two years before, and he was angry. He was angry at God. He was angry at the church. He wasn't going to church anymore. He had just kind of dropped his faith because he couldn't answer the question, why? Why, God, can you and would you do this to us? And so um, they called for Justin. They said, get Justin over here. And he sat down with that young man, both hurting, and Justin, in tears, shared for 45 minutes his faith, and he shared these verses from 2 Corinthians and from 1 Peter that we had just talked about just a few hours before. See how the Lord just orchestrated everything. And Justin was able to pour out the pain that was in his heart, yet with faith, in a way that was very healing to him. But as he did with tears, the translator was crying. 
the young man was crying. Dave and Scott were crying and everyone that was observing. It was just like a, a great big session of, uh, of God intervening. And at the end of that time, the young man said, I'm going to return to God. I'm going to return to church. And he hugged Justin. And he said, and I'm going to see you again in heaven. That made that whole trip worthwhile. That made the things that we were sharing together that a number of us were going through, uh, circumstances that were times of trial and suffering, but it was all worth it for that one young man. And I'm sure Justin would say he began to see. In fact, you know what he said? He said, you know, I've heard about this thing about divine appointments, but I've never been a big believer in that, and I've never really seen it before, but that was a divine appointment. I know that God did that for him and for me and for us, and that all the timing of this was just something that God had orchestrated. And so why do bad things happen to good people? To show the world the genuineness of our faith and our love for the Lord to his honor and to his praise and his glory. And I'd add something to that as someone who's been uh, walking with the Lord for many years. Many times it's to show me the genuineness of my faith and love to the Lord because there's a saying that's absolutely true and that's this. Human beings are the only, only uh, part of the animal kingdom that's capable of self-deception. And it's so hard sometimes to know what your genuine heart toward the Lord is. How much do I really love the Lord? And sometimes the Lord calls us to circumstances like suffering to reveal that to us, whether it's in our weakness and that we need to grow stronger in our connection with the Lord and our clinging to Him, or to show the strength that He's given us uh, that will be revealed under those times of heat and trials. Here's the fourth life skills principle, and that's this. How we respond to suffering and trials is directly related to our view of who God is. How we respond to suffering and trials is directly related to our view at that moment of who God is and how genuinely we trust him and love him. Now, this is the thing that I really want to challenge us all on today, and that's this. We find God in the Bible. We find him in his character, in his word. And if we want to grow strong and be men and women of great faith and great ministers of the faith as physicians and dentists and healers, then we have to spend an unlimited amount of time in God's word with him alone, finding his character and internalizing and receiving his character into ours through his spirit and getting to know him so well that when circumstances arise and trials come up and suffering occurs, we know him and we're connected with him and we draw to him and cling to him tightly during those times rather than getting angry at God and saying, how can you do this? Why is this happening? Why haven't you stepped in and prevented this kind of like a spoiled child you know, who really doesn't get the big picture? And so my challenge to you is that you dig into the word. I know you're in residencies. That doesn't matter. You have time. We all have time. If we're disciplined to spend that time each day with the Lord in his word, in, a med in meditation, in prayer, drawing close to him. As you look at Genesis, for example, and you read through it, in Genesis 15:1, God says to a scared Abram, he says, do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield and your very great reward. There's kind of a double promise there. God's saying, hey, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm protecting you, and my presence is your very great reward. But at the same time, he's saying, don't worry, Abram. I'm sovereign over your circumstances, and promise your reward will be very great. And so, uh, Psalm, how well did David know the Lord, even though he had many trials and circumstances and suffering in his life. And yet you find the true character of God there through the words 
inspired through David in, in chapter 13, verse 5 of Psalms. David says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart, Lord, rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praises, for he has been good to me. There's a man that spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. That's why he can say that with confidence. In Philippians, why is it and how is it that Paul can rejoice in prison? He says in Philippians, for me to live, oh, that's Christ. And free for me to die, oh, that's to gain. How well does he know Christ? How close is he clinging closely? Is he clinging to the Lord? For me to live, I, I only live for Christ. And for me to die, I can't wait. See, that's when things are going to really all be perfect. And so there's a man with the big picture. There's someone who understands. So here's the challenge as we wrap it up here. Will you accept the challenge to get to know the true character of God as discovered through his word? And as you meet him there, will you pray that he will fill your spirit with his Holy Spirit as you meditate and pray, and that through this you'll come to share in Paul's understanding and in Paul's conviction and respond under fire as Paul did where you can say, hey, this isn't a good thing, and I wouldn't have chosen it, but here's the deal. His grace, it's sufficient for me. And then when you're in the clinics and when you're in your office when you're sitting with patience and you have these truths deeply planted in your heart so that it's the reality of who you are and he gives you strength through your own sufferings and your own trials which will surely come as part of building your character and your testimony of him you'll be able to share those personal messages and those verses that have come alive for you with strong conviction this isn't your opinion anymore. This isn't my philosophy versus other philosophies. This is the truth that you have lived and others will see as you serve other people that are hurting badly and who are suffering badly, who are in physical pain and sometimes even dying. You'll be able to say with a smile holding their hand and tears in your eyes as you love on them, you'll say, and his grace is sufficient for you too. I know it, and I love you, and I'm with you, and he's with you. And so through trials and suffering, I hope that you'll see that you're being equipped to treat the whole person. And as someone of influence like you will have, expect it, embrace it. And uh, the one who you will care for, who we will call your patient, you will be helping them not only physically, but more importantly in the end, you'll be ministering to their soul and their spirit. So let's pray that we will do that as we receive God's word. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you that indeed it's true and your promise is true to us, that your grace is sufficient for us and that your strength which is overall is sufficient for us and made perfect in our weakness. Lord, we know that we're weak, and we pray that your spirit who indwells us will grow larger and larger every day in our hearts and take control of our hearts and our minds, our attitudes, and our response to you, so that as we're filled with your spirit, the real spirit of Christ will live through us and be able to minister to other people in a powerful way. And I pray that each student, each resident, each intern here will impact thousands and thousands of lives for the kingdom in their, during their careers. And I praise you for them, Lord, that you've called them to this special ministry of the healing arts of medicine and dentistry. And I just pray your greatest blessing on them as they follow you and cling to you. We pray these things for your honor and glory as we look expectantly forward to seeing you face to face in the very near future. Amen. Thank you all.